So hello folks, welcome to another uh, round of design roundtable, industry roundtable. This time we are talking about leadership and we have Geeta Bhatt with us, we have Astagor and we have Karthi. So just to give a quick introduction, Karthi. Uh, Karthi's career spans over 20 years. She started her career as a software engineer, then restarted her career uh, <laughs> as, uh, at HP as a, a designer and later on she would become a uh, design faculty, visiting design faculty at uh, NID and at MIT. And her recent venture is Experience School, where she teaches product design and management to the next generation of product designers and PMs. Then we have Asta with us. Asta has been in the designer industry for 13 years. She did her bachelor's in design from NIFT and then master's in fine arts and graphic design from California Institute of Design. In the past, she's worked with brands like uh, Distinct, Yahoo, and now she's senior manager of UX at Google. And she also has a TikTok account that I really, really enjoy. You should go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, finally, we have Geeta Bhatt. Uh, uh, and all of us find it hard to spell her name. So check it out on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> who got a master's in design from NID and uh, she's been in the design industry for over 15 years. In the past, she has worked with brands like Human Factor International, Tech Mahindra, Network 18s, and now she is a UX design lead at CleverTap. So welcome to all of you. Uh, super really looking forward to this. And uh, just right with the intro, I have my first question. What made you choose this career to begin with? Like, why choose design? Um, so when I started, I mean, I don't know if this is common with North India, but South India, there are only two options. Either you become a designer or, a, uh, sorry, uh, an engineer or a doctor. That's right. it. I mean, there's nothing in between. Right. So for me, um, I, I wanted to do something between human and technology. I, I felt this need urge in around 14, 15 years. So when I went and talked about it to my friends, to mom, they thought I want to become a HR because it has human and resources in that. And they, I, I, I was asked to apply for XLRI after my engineering because your uh, BE, MBA is a good tag, right? I mean, right. Um, I, I, I had a, a, a very dear friend who was in, in, you know, doing her MBA in PR and right. I looked at her subjects. I said, I, this is not my cup of tea. Uh, so I didn't even know that something like design existed. So I was a hardcore C++ programmer. So it's a very funny story. Um, I, I used to work for uh, Satyam as a, uh, so through consulting assignment, I happened to work with State Farm Insurance. So there was a guy called Karthik Subramanian who was supposed to show up to office to join a new team as a service engineer. And this fellow did not give any notice. He just vanished. Like, and the client manager didn't know how to present somebody. He's like, come here. Your name sounds very close. Karthi will cut the, the, the uh, behind part of it. Karthi Subraman. I don't think um, our white friends will ever understand your name. So I'm going to send you there. And you also have a short hair. So we will manage with it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I go there and they were like, but are we not, you know, waiting for a guy? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, this is God. <laughs> and I happen to be the service engineer for a human factors team for the first time. Right. So that is when they told me do a prototype like this for me. I'm like, okay, this can be done in 10 ways. And let me show you everything. And they're like, we like you because you are able to think. And I started saying, okay, this is performance oriented. This is quick. This is, you know, we can use DHTML here. He can, like, you, you can start. So being a service engineer means giving shape to the thoughts of a designer. Then I asked the question, like how he asked in pursuit of happiness. Hey man, I want to ask you two questions, right? How did you do this? And, uh, you know, where did you get it from? Stuff like that. So they said, you need to do a PhD in in probably cognitive psychology. I'm like, what the hell is that? Um, so that's where it started. And then I realized that there is a subject called as human factors engineering. There is a subject called as cognitive science. And there is, there is, and so I was in Illinois at that time. So stone throw away was, um, you know, uh, University of Illinois, Urbana and Champaign. So it's like 70 miles. I have to calculate that. And that is how I ended up 
figuring out something like cognitive science and it was a fascinating journey i hope they never found that kartik subramanian <laughs> i'm so thankful to him <laughs> so that was that, that is when i realized oh there is a human and there is a technology and we are bridging the gap so it was an accidental find but i think uh, it was grace in many ways uh, this is what i was looking for when i figured out the name uh, I, i had to move to singapore and i i had to tell ali i said i don't know how to code i know only to design so that's when you really become a designer there's no to you you just burn your ship and that that was very very powerful for me my mom is like <laughs> uh this guy that's my husband yeah if this guy can earn so much why are you not doing it this is nuts why, why are you taking up a job which pays you so little i'm like mom this is it i i found my love and and that's about it it's like a love story right so long winded answer but i i i it was important for you to know all the nuances it, it just happens accidentally it's amazing how after that i never look back it's been 15 uh 16 years hmm. totally new. wow yes what 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 a strange <laughs> of circumstances and i love the fact that they totally knew they could pass off karthi as karthi again and just they wouldn't know <laughs> agita how did you uh, choose this why did you say end up choosing design yeah so uh kind of very similar actually i and i could completely empathize uh, what you were saying uh and to be honest i don't know how uh, whether to call my journey as a butterfly effect or a pretty straight forward journey with you know probably right choices at right time and bumping into right uh, people um, so kind of since childhood i had a very predictable academic journey right until uh, i chose computer science engineering for obvious reasons uh, can't think same reasons right you could either the do engineering or you could take up medical and i was i stuck at bio so engineering was the right choice 11th 12th vocational computer science and then uh this is also interesting after 12th standard actually i my brother came up with some list of 13 disciplines i could actually take up and uh, you know uh, i i actually gave entrance exams for everything and i eventually secured admission in jj school of architecture very next day i secured admission for computer science engineering so my dear family uh, kind of brainwashed me i'm sorry alex this is for your own good you left to bear with us for a while alex go back he's saying hey engineering college beautiful college and you know you you're already a you know vocational computer science student it just makes sense architecture the sal internship you you just you know it's just take it up so with a very heavy heart i cancelled my admission to jj and i uh, i chose engineering uh, and then over time right circumstances led me to nid very accidentally again while i was exploring what i could do because because that urge to create stayed with me and uh, i chose a very new discipline hardly known at that point of time which was called software and user interface design in nid i was just the second batch of that discipline in fact i was the first batch of gandhinagar campus and uh, mm. it was in the jungle <laughs> so uh now it is so much better oh my is, god it is, it's wonderful yes and uh, during my final uh, internship at tech mahindra uh, my seniors uh, directed me to hfi uh, and i spent first 5 years of my career with uh, human factors international wonderful 5 years i've learned a lot there uh, and uh, you know uh, so this journey of this uh, computer science engineering and nid and human factors international when i look back kind of led me to something that needs a balance between tech and design which i always strive for i think and uh, my natural instinct was always about uh, solving problems and very complex problems in a visual way and down the line when i you know uh, look back it just feels like uh, this was right place to be in um my story is slightly different but lots of similarities i actually think for anyone who is like around our age and doing what we are doing we couldn't have started with the idea of doing this thing because it didn't exist back then right like when we were in high school <laughs> no one knew what being a product designer ux is or any research any of this right oh my god what is that 
But um, so throughout my life, I wanted to be in the Indian Air Force. That was my dream. And then when I was in like 10th grade, I found out that women were not allowed to fly combat planes in the Air Force, only cargo planes. Oh my God, what is that? And I was like, well, nah, I don't want to fly a cargo plane. In that case, I should do something else. <laughs> So just like you said, like there was this whole thing of, oh, maybe you can do engineering because I was studying computer science in 11th and 12th grade. And I actually really enjoyed it. We, like I was basically doing C++ and I really had fun with it. But I knew that I did not want to study engineering. I basically just did not want to continue on, on with chemistry. I was okay with physics. I was okay with math. And I was like, that's it. No more chemistry. So some, I don't know who told me, but someone told me about NID and that's when I saw what they did. And there were some things that resonated with me, but some things that didn't. One, I was 17 and I didn't want to go live in a dry state at that point. <laughs> Where you honestly so I'm like, oh, man, you're not. And then someone told me that NIFT in Bangalore has a program that's very, very similar. And I was like, Bangalore sounds amazing. I'm going to go mm -hmm. do that. <laughs> so at that point, it was called um, product design, but now it can be confusing. So I just say industrial design because that's basically what we were doing there. Uh, so as I was doing that, in my second year, I was interning at Ford. Uh, I was working on that car, Ford Fida, that was made just for India, like a couple of years ago. I don't think it did very well. But I was designing like the combination lever switches, the indicator switches and all those. And I remember I had designed this one thing and a robotic arm was just flipping it on and off like thousands of times to check durability. And I looked at it and I knew instantly this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. Because I was just like, what am I doing here? So then I found out about graphic design and I decided that's what I wanted to do. So uh, soon after college, I moved here, did my master's, loved graphic design, started working as a graphic designer um, and with this firm that only worked for nonprofits. So one of the things that I realized was that we can do like amazing graphic design for nonprofits, but ultimately people go to the website to donate something. And if the website mm. just doesn't work well or it doesn't work as intended, then donations don't come through. So I pitched to my boss at and we were a small firm that, hey, can we start redoing their websites? And he was yeah. like, I don't know how to do that. Do you know? I was like, I don't know either, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really how I got into this UX design field. And even back then, it didn't really have a name or that name at least. Um, but what I realized was that I could really combine my skills that I had learned in industrial design and graphic design and really put them together uh, towards, you know, just driving the donations up for our clients and then we created a UX design team there and that was the beginning of the journey. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> now, uh, extending on, on your story, I want to understand what made you get into leadership? What, uh, you know, what shaped you to uh, or encouraged you to get into leadership? Not all folks end up being leaders. You don't choose to be a leader. Uh, you're pushed into it. Uh, <laughs> at least in my case, that's what happened. So whenever you are this five star IC, you are generally asked, uh, you know, what would your next promotion be like? And um, there is one time they will make you a manager. And, and that's what happened with me. Uh, I told my manager that you are making a mistake. Uh, and he said that if you want this printer to go out, this was in HP, you need to have enough you know allies and enough buy-in and all these words and it's like if you can't really make them uh, come to an agreement if you can't convince them then you're not shipping this this product out so you have to take up uh, management and uh, that's the only way that you are going to uh, make this happen and he used um, I, I still remember Sean's word Sean is the CEO of Philips and he was my first boss director of uh, design in HP and he's like, Karthi, if you want to do anything worthwhile in design, you should be able to convince, articulate what you're doing as design. What you're dreaming, it is important that you make others dream about it. And that can happen, not as an IC, only as a manager. So you better pick this up. So he, he, he sent this to me. Um, I was actually on a sick leave. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but I had to go through an atypical blood disorder, which was very close to a, a leukemia kind of a thing. So I had to take five months off from HP. And he said that, I know you are in a holiday or rather in, in, a, in a vacation. Um, you are getting better. I trust that you will come back and you will crush it. And he sent this uh, letter to me saying that you are the manager. I'm like, I have no idea. Sean, you have no idea if I will be alive. Why are you doing this to me? He's like, 
if you have to do what you have to do, this is the place that you have to be. And I couldn't say no to this man because he was so persuasive, convincing. And I, he's like, it's easy. I mean, just you, you should be able to do it. And first year, he gave me a B rating. B rating. I have never seen a B rating in my life. Right? This is like two <laughs> on five. I'm like, Sean, how is this even possible? He's like, you sucked. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean I sucked? I did well. I mean, look at, he's like, for a five-star IC, five-star matters, Karthi. But when you are a manager, you need to work with somebody who is one star and make them five star. If you can't do that, you are not doing your job. And hence, you are not able to make your one star people five star. So I give you a two star because you worked a little hard. I'm like, oh my God. That was the, I, I still remember that night. I went to Margarita's. It's an amazing Mexican restaurant. And I told Sabrish, my husband, order me two pictures of Margarita. Let's go <laughs> crush it today. And that, it was so sad. I mean, I have never seen that rating in my life. And, and that's how you get pushed. And from then on, it, it was a very different journey. Um, yeah, we, we will talk about more of that. But if, if he did not push me, I, I don't think I would have ever, ever taken this up. Never. Sitting in those rooms, I, no way. <laughs> I can draw a lot of parallels between your story and my story, Karthi, because um, anyway, generally speaking, I was never a backbencher. I was uh, I was kind of, you know, that uh, proactive kid in the in the class and in the school who would be, you know, uh, on top of everything. Uh, professionally, however, I landed my first manager job extremely unpredicted and unprepared like a designated survivor. I mean, I'm, I'm literally giving you that <laughs> metaphor because it was so. <laughs> um, so when I joined Burp uh, all these years back as a senior UX right out of HFI, I didn't have a team. I was not supposed to have a team because the company didn't have a discipline called UX back then. It did have a design team which was headed by a design head. Uh, and the graphics team, visual design team, reported into the design manager. And right after I joined, another couple of months down the line, suddenly he leaves. Okay, I had absolutely no hand in him leaving, but he leaves. Now the entire team is kind of orphan and my CEO back then, uh, the, he he just gives me the team and the department of design has landed in my hand. So it was completely accidental. My first job as a manager, right? Um, and thereafter, actually, thanks to my mentors back then, I have always been put in a situation of firefighting whenever required. So I was kind of a firefighter, not just for the design team, but I've managed scrum teams. I've managed front end teams alongside design team. I've... Uh, I've uh, put the product hat, I've taken product decisions, I've uh, discussed engineering back and forth with the back-end engineers, uh, shipped code to the production, etc, 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 right? And uh, leadership actually uh, came alongside. It, it's been a learning. Uh, so working with co-founders of CleverTap uh, to create something from scratch it taught me a lot more than just, you know, being a manager or just design it. I call it a live MBA, by the way. I always, I always <laughs> think that I really don't need a second, uh, uh, you know, MBA because uh, this is a live school and it, it kind of made me evolve from being a manager into a leader. And the journey is very similar to you, uh, Karthi, because uh, in the beginning, I sucked. I mean, uh, there are a lot of things you need to learn. Uh, you know, it's it's not just about being perfect at your job, but it's about how do you take the people in your team along? How do you time manage? How do you put deadlines uh, in picture? How do you project manage? How, are you a people's person or not? Are, is your Does your team love you? Does your team respect you? So that entire journey came a long way uh, and I'm, I'm still learning i'm not saying that I've, I've evolved to become a perfect one but every day is a learning uh, and that's okay. how i that's how i ended up uh, being a leader uh i think my i've always had an affinity towards i don't know if i should call it leading but basically like just organizing and 
you know, trying to make, like one of my managers says this, or one of my previous managers says this, that uh, leadership is the only way you can make two plus two five. Like I really do believe in that. And I've always believed in that. Like even back in school, like I was the head girl of my school and we organized to, you know, I don't know if you remember, but like our school uniform for girls. So men used to wear those leather shoes or boys and girls used to wear these ballerina like shoes, but like a strap. And I just thought that was stupid. So we organized and changed it. So all of us were allowed to wear sneakers, black sneakers. And I thought that was a huge win. And really that was an early leadership lesson because I didn't do it myself. I organized the whole prefectorial board to go convince people, work on this. And we were in, um, um, I studied at Delhi Public School. So like it was a big deal that we could get that done because it's like a huge school system to convince, right? So that was like an early lesson for me. But obviously back then I didn't make the parallels of, oh, this means I should be a manager someday. Of course not. Mm. I just knew that I loved getting people together and really capitalizing on that the idea of people's talents coming together and producing something that's much bigger than what any of us would have done on our own, right? Um, so how I got into leadership and management is always because I wanted to do something and I needed people to do it. So I had to build a team. So mm. when we started doing UX design, um, I kind of knew how to code. So I was building websites myself, designing them myself, doing like research or whatever you know, I could do myself. And then I realized that because it started to work, we started to see like our, the donations go up. So ne then we knew that we had to scale because I was only working with one client. So then it was all up to me. Like, how do I, who do I hire? How do I organize it? Do I hire one person for each one of our clients or do I hire a specialist and then organize more of a horizontal team, all these decisions. And basically that's how um, I ended up building a team of, that was doing UX back then. I don't know. We also called it probably web design or something at that point. <laughs> really? And then just became a leader like that. Um, and then even at Google, it was really interesting because I was hired as the first UXer in LA. So it was almost like an experiment that, yes, we do have this big engineering team in LA. Let's see. We want to build a UX team, but there is no UX leadership. Let's hire this one person. Let's see how they do. And let's see if they want to build a team around them. And, you know, if this UX thing even works out in LA. Um, so that's pretty much how it started to the same story repeated where, yes, I was hired. I was doing all this work. It was going well. They wanted to move more work down in LA, but there were no people. So I ended up hiring a team and building a team around me. Um, so it's a very similar story and very interesting that it's the same thing in a really small <laughs> design for me at Google too. Uh, you know, a common theme that I see uh, in all, all three of you is uh, one was, it was all people pushing you to that role, whether it was uh, the team that you had built pushing you forward or whether the people who wanted you to become managers pushing you forward. So it seems like a, a common theme that, what, what do you feel about that? And what are the nuances that, you know, you feel today that when you are picking up leaders, right, that you are aware of that you want to continue and pay it forward, some things that you want to carry forward and some things that you slightly want to change from, you know, how you experienced it. So Sean was in San Diego, right? So I was in Singapore uh, leading this um, IWS global design team for the printing division. So he wanted somebody in Singapore talking design and he couldn't come. So he literally wanted a replacement who talks sense, um, you know, like him, his words, um, and, and, and going ahead and telling people this is important, getting funding, make sure, you know, the headcount is rolling in, all that stuff. So, and I understood this trick only later um, because when I went and told him, I need to talk to you every day. And he's like, I don't have time. Um, I'm like, then give me a manager here in, in Singapore, like somebody who can lead me. Um, so he was like, okay, let me create a competency um, director or something like that. And he suddenly brought in Pablo and he said, okay, hereafter you will report to Pablo and you both will live in Singapore. Don't bug me anymore. I'm like, oh, wow, that's how it happens. Um, so it's all about uh, making sure that those roles, it's like a drama, right? And, and there are different roles in that drama and you need to have people to act in that particular role. And you need to find the right people, right stature, right words to, to come in. So if you want a beam in, in, in a Mahabharata, you should look like a beam. And you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot be puny. And, no, that doesn't work. So that is what I understood as hiring your um, successor line, hiring uh, the right, you know, the, the leadership. 
So this happened, um, this was 2008-2009 time frame. So Singapore government was giving a lot of uh, funds for developing design studios. So they wanted all these large companies to go ahead and bring design designers from across the world and the government was paying money. And this was, I don't know how many million dollars they paid us. So we had funds to go ahead and splurge and build a 10,000 square foot kind of a, a studio. So he's like, Karthi, go ahead, hire 33 designers in next two years. I'm like, are you kidding me? In the human factors program in NTU, we take four people. You are asking me to build 33 people in two years. This is impossible. We went ahead and that is how um, hiring became a big part. I realized that that is, that is the, uh, you know, <laughs> you are a part-time recruiter <laughs> as a manager. So that's how we start building up because the funds came in. We have an opportunity and to take care of the opportunity, we have the capability and because we have the capability and the opportunity, we create the resources. So I was a resource in many ways, in a nice way. I mean, I, I'm very, very indebted to everything that Sean pushed me into. But this is how he was thinking, OK, who is going to take care of this role? Who is going to talk to this? Uh, who, how are we going to make sure that this product ships? How are we going to bring design into HP? So that is how um, we started. And he was telling me, make sure you are creating another Karthi. And that was every week he used to tell me. I'm like, why? Why is, why is it important? Because to make a Karthi, it will take time. You have to start doing it so that you can move up. Till you do that, I'm not going to promote you. I'm like, is that a threat? He's like, no, no, no. That's just information to you. Yeah, You're, you cannot move up till you bring somebody like you. So it was planned that there is an org structure and they plan accordingly. And this is a well-played chess game. And, and I understood it only when it was explained to me. So there's nothing like somebody plans for you. You have to plan for yourself. So if you need another person, you better have them ready. So the, in, in leadership, it was interesting that you create yours so that you move up. In the, in, in the IC world, that is not how it is, right? So it was very, uh, it was a, you know, a mental model change for me. So it was exciting to see, oh, okay, I have to hire my own replacement. And my journey actually, right, from, like I said, the, the manager uh, tag came when I started at Burp. And then from Burp, the Network 18 happened and the same set of people uh, moved on to create CleverTap. And when we, when we started CleverTap, there was, Nobody, right? Three co-founders and uh, there was Gita. And uh, practically, I had to put many hats uh, apart from being a designer. It was, uh, it was obviously a designer. It was definitely product. There was no product, so paper, pen, sketch, and you know, think product. And so, it the journey started again from that manager. It got reset to, uh, you know, uh, some a designer come product, and then from there, kind of it it restarted for me uh, it was not that i was managing a team of uh, five before and then you know it it went i went on to uh, take that team to make it a team of 10 or 13 so it kind of i had a break in between where i had to literally uh, you know let go of everything and start something from scratch and that uh, was a fun journey because uh, initial couple three years was again going back to being an IC and IC and how, you know, because uh, there's nothing that you're tweaking there, there is, you're making something all over, you know, from scratch and from beginning and that time your thinking hat is there. So from that role, suddenly uh, the product started expanding and then we felt that, you know, I am not able to cope up with so much, right? I, I need to hire people and that's where the hunt began and trust me i think one of the most difficult job for a manager or for a leader is to hire right people in your team Oof. that takes i think the maximum time because it's not just about the talent it's about the culture fit it's about you know the right attitude there's so much that goes into it so all these years you know hiring has become you know the key thing uh, I have a wonderful team today, uh, but when I look back at that journey, how how I built my team, it, it's taught me a lot. 
sometimes there were wrong hires sometimes you know the person you know uh, got into the team as a graphic designer but evolved now to become uh, so compatible with uh, you know what we do today absorb so much of complexity and it's really I'm, i'm actually proud to see the person who joined us four years back as a you know from the product or industrial design background and joined us as a graphic designer evolved to become a full fledged uh, you know engineering friendly product designer and that when i when i look back at that journey i feel okay we've achieved something as a manager uh, so yeah it's it's incredible that uh, as a manager you get to shape the life of uh, you know uh, people and uh, kind of uh, have some part have, have some role to play into their uh, learning also for i think for me hiring is um well now i have a framework that makes it pretty simple it's basically yes of course the craft has to be good but i do a uh, values based hiring because that's how i've seen that if i hire based on values then i'm able to build a team that has diversity because you know there's like all kinds of people on the team different styles different preferences you know some all kinds of different dimensions there's diversity but the values are all the same which is what makes it work and the values are very simple so the first one is you have to put people first um not team first you have to put people first like there is a difference right and you, that can be a long debate in itself the second one is you have to take pride in your craft and be very very much oriented towards craft which is also debatable in some ways because like craft means different things to different people and um you know a lot of ux designers are pushing back against this idea of like craft because oh, we're not the people who make things look pretty or like the, that whole thing which i completely believe in also um but yes i do take pride in all aspects of our craft and i, I hope that everyone on our team does too and the third one is that we put our product teams above the ux team so really what that means is our cross functional team is what the team that we belong to before we belong to the ux team and even here the inverse isn't necessarily bad some people absolutely put ux team first and that's fine that's just not how i operate and that's not how the team operates so like a manifestation of that would be we don't really do things like a ux vision deck because that's nothing we just do vision deck for the product and everyone works on it right um so the cool thing about this is that i believe that the only requirement to be a good leader is that you have to care about people proactively like really care about people um and because i hire based on these three values the first value is already a filter right the first value putting people first it already filters out people who would not be good members of the team and also not be good leads on the team the other thing is that because i hire based on values every single ic that i hire is legitimately a good candidate to be a leader someday because you know just by logic they have the requirements that i believe make for a good leader so i think it just simplifies the whole process like obviously hiring is hard um it takes up a lot of time i completely agree it's like the p0 right for any manager uh, but having a framework in place just makes the whole thing much easier and predictable and standard right makes a lot of sense i think we're going to circle back to the topic of uh, people and uh, especially hiring people and shaping the organization and the culture by uh, you know this method of hiring but i quickly want to touch upon um, uh, this brief idea, idea of how has in you know during your uh, over decade of span of a career how has leadership and organizational behavior evolved uh, uh, you know 10 years ago we would not see enough women leader in tech world uh, not that we see enough w- women leaders now but there's at least some change that has started to happen in that direction some conversation has begun um also at the same time you know uh, encouraging and growing people that has become uh, like kathi said like now you grow people unlike when in, uh, you know in traditional uh, you know uh, system where you were line managers etc you may not want that you may have a comfort spot that this is how things work so how have you seen organizations change and uh, this behavior change over time during the course of your career when i started my career um, especially in hp it was 2006 2007 time frame so we never had something called as culture fit we never had uh, ux recruiters we we did not have anything actually we had to build everything from scratch so the mandate came and said okay go ahead and build an idea iws global design studio in singapore um you will bring uh, 33 people in in next two years all this was great but how do you do it and that is when i think we started um 
we started becoming a little more creative. Uh, so at the end of end of probably two years in 2009, we had about 45 people, not just 33, and nine different nationals were there. So to attract people from different countries to come to Singapore and to come to work for as boring a product like a printer, it's a big deal, right? So none of our recruiters were able to kind of understand what we were talking. And so they will come and give me, they did, they, they did best of their work. But I, I used to say, no, 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 not like this. No, no, no. This is not how we look at a UXer. No, no, no. It's not visual design. It's, it's, it's user experience. It was very hard. So we need to start out with the playbook of how we will start looking at the various roles, responsibilities. So that is when I realized, oh, management is more of a um, organizing job. Like you, you, you are a great, um, you, you know exactly which goes where. You are very process oriented, you are very organized. Whereas leadership on the other hand is very, um, you know, heart, head oriented job, a very different job. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm really explaining it properly, but this is, this is, this has nothing to do with management. It is, it has everything to do with who you are. And that is what was the huge difference. So I started seeing that, okay, every single designer in that particular, you know, studio should be a leader. Your role can be a different, you, you, you can be called as somebody but what you're doing, you are, you are executing it with leadership. So leadership, um, then I started writing this 10 uh, point, uh, like what defines a good design leader. And, and every single person in my team was that um, idea at the center, like how you were talking about Asta, it's the product, it's the project, like that's the center. And everybody's working towards that. Your attention to detail is very high. Done is different. Done, done, done is very different. So like this, I, I still have the 10 point. And this 10 points is what defined every single organization that I led uh, from there on. And um, I, I came up with this hiring um, you know, process, like a very detailed breaking down, analyzing algorithm in the Excel to really make something happen like that. So. There is a lot of work, a lot of times people told me, you're a manager, you shouldn't be working so hard. And I'm like, this is the work. <laughs> this is where you, you do all the work. <laughs> how can a manager not work? And how, how do managers not work? Because this was like a phenomenal amount of thinking and doing and organizing and following up and making sure things are happening, right? So that is how we started building the design culture. We speak the same language. We all have the same presentations. We try and put together, you know, that is where we started creating a culture of excellence, a culture of, you know, details, a culture of, we will discuss about this and empathy. Today we are talking about empathy as if it is one point of that five point process, but that's how we lived because we understood the problems of firmware, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, platform team, software engineering team, QA. We wrote white papers for them. We gave them chocolates when they came to our studio. So these are all little, little things that we started doing. These people are nice. Suddenly they started saying that this design team is nice, whether they do work or not, that's a different story, but they're nice people. And that's where we started. And I think that was a huge win. And um, so culture uh, to me is nothing but visibility. You are just having sense to kind of take care of the other person. So today there are, these are big words, <laughs> jargons we use, but in all reality, they were all developed because they were non-existent. That's the only way we can bring a bunch of people speak the same language. One person speaking that language is not a big deal, but 30, 40 people speaking that is a completely different story. So design ops was important, culture was important, your hiring practices were important. We needed to make sure that we were crafting that person, right? We hired somebody, but raw, and we need to craft that person. So I used to spend the first 90 days of that person. Personally, I used to have a one-to-one -one every fortnight. And that was, imagine having one-to-one -one with some 30 people. It, it, it was a lot. So I had to hire managers to manage these things. That's a nightmare. We will talk later. But <laughs> that's how it started evolving just for sensibility's sake. And slowly we saw results coming. It took 18 months, 20 months to really feel this. That's when I understood, oh my God, culture takes a long time. As an anthropologist, I mean, I, I understand it, but 
I thought it was much easier with, you know, highly educated people. <laughs> Not really. Civilization takes time. Right. And also culture is something that evolves, that it emerges over time, right? Like, so it's, it's, it's very hard that you can put it in totally. place. Totally. Gita, what has your experience been like over the years of, uh, you know, growing as a leader and how has these functions changed? How have you evolved? It's a big change from how people perceive and I'll especially talk about uh, women leaders here, right? How, how people perceived that before and uh, how, how that situation and how the companies are more supportive towards uh, women leaders today. Uh, it's obviously nobody hands over a leadership position to you because you're a woman right it's not for the sake of inclusion they'll they'll just say hey because we want to make you know certain percentage of leadership in our uh, women leadership in our company this you are leader today onwards it goes uh, hand in hand with the value you have to offer to the organization and i think skill is uh, utmost important so if I, I completely believe if you prove yourself qualified for the position or uh, and the organization, the, the whole behavior, right, uh, evolves to become more and more supportive. Uh, and for me, actually, it has come a long way from when I look back to my first job to now. Uh, all these years, uh, almost 11 years back, uh, when my daughter was born, there was a, you know, struggle, struggle keeping, uh, you know, work-life balance, motherhood balance and flexi work hours given to me by my then manager were you know a topic of discussion by a few it was kind of frustrating uh, given that you know no impact of work would be done by you know uh, the mother uh, but uh, for the second one i was actually lucky to be with the right set of people and uh, the the support of the team was incredible so uh, world has evolved since then and uh, women kind of wear multiple hats uh, they multitask like a boss and uh, teams more often than not i feel are extremely supportive these days and uh, that's how i think so i think i took this question uh, uh, as how the organizational behavior towards women leader has changed over the years and that's how i feel there is a stark difference between when i what i saw all these years back and what i see today I think so many things have changed and so many things have changed for the better, right? Like it's um, just talking about the industry in general. First, people understand our discipline a lot better now than they did even like three years ago. That simplifies a lot of things, right? Because then otherwise there's yet another thing that you have to prove. You have to prove yourself as a woman. In my case, I have to prove myself as a you know person of color here in the US but or as a brown person and much harder for other races, of course. Um, and then I also have to be like, oh, yes, and UX is valuable. <laughs> 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 At least I don't have to do that anymore. So, I, you know, if there are people who are just getting into UX, listening to this, whenever this goes live, I actually think this is a really good time to enter the industry. Like a lot of the hard work um, has been done by, like really said people, your generation who've like paved that path now and spread awareness about UX. So I think that has changed in the industry for sure. Um, you are right. There is a lot more talk of servant leadership and growing people and not that authoritative leadership aspect, which has also changed. So many good books have been written about this in the last like 10 to 15 years, right? Leaders Eat Last and The Culture Map and all of these books come to mind where, you know, people are at least talking about this. For women, I will say that I have the advantage uh, over a lot of other women that I don't have kids. And why, why I say that is an advantage is because it is right it reduces the other things and core other things that i have to do in my day-to-day -day life so i don't claim to understand completely what a mother would go through but i do observe it uh, based on like women on my team and i think things have changed and why how things have changed is people are talking about it and people are more conscious of it has it been solved no it hasn't and i think that's something that like I want to be very aware of because if we think it's been solved then we're not going to think about it and work towards it, right? It has absolutely not been solved and some of these things I also don't know how they will be solved but we just like chip at them and work through them slowly and slowly but at least we are talking about it now. Like one of the examples is one of the researchers on my team and she's brilliant. She's probably like the best researcher I've ever worked with. So she had a kid and she came back and she works really hard. She always works really hard to the point that we were just like, no, you need to 
do lesser, but that's just her, right? Like she's a superstar. So sure, she's able to maintain her well-being and work this hard, great, good for her, right? Uh, but someone on the team said to her that, hey, I know you might have too much happening right now, so I can take this on. And the fact that multiple people in the room just went, no, she said she can do it, let her do it. It was just amazing, right? Because this person came with from a really good place. Like he was actually just thinking, she just had a baby, she's already working on 10 things, does she really need an 11th thing to work on? But here's the thing, it's her decision. If she wants to work on the 11th thing, great, let her do it. So I just feel like that's what has changed. People are more conscious, people will correct their behavior when it's pointed out, but it's just unconscious bias that all of us grew up with, including me, and it's not going to change overnight. We have to work towards changing that individually and then also organizationally as a result. That makes a ton of sense, uh, you know, like uh, slowly shifting the behavior. Uh, uh, and speaking of which, like, you know, we spoke about hiring, we spoke about uh, encouraging women and uh, the field opening up discussions more around this topic and making subtle changes, which are positive in nature. However, uh, even if you go to a design event today, like uh, now the events are not happening, but you can see the crowd is filled with men. Um, especially in a country like India, most of the design events are filled with mostly with men. And <clears throat> same ratio you see online forums, same ratio you see offline forums, same ratio you see in hiring pool, right? Uh, so uh, what, where did we go wrong as an industry where we fail to encourage more young women to join or, or look at design field as an option? Because especially in, let's say, engineering, right, uh, may not suffer as much without diversity than a field like design, which can practically die without diversity, without inclus in in inclusivity. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, where did we go wrong? What can we do? Uh, or am I wrong here? Or am I like, am I observational, like anecdotal? What has your observation been on that? I, I can uh, go first on this, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Very passionate about. Uh, we so are this. Inviting me. <laughs> okay. So I don't think that's true. I think there are, I'm just looking at my experience, right? The point about women entering the industry, I don't know if that is itself is true. Because I just, I went to design school. Yes, it was industrial design in India. And there were more women than men in there. I also looked at the class senior, like my senior, the class like one year of, or two years senior than me, my juniors. It was pretty much the case, like across the board, right? Yet, we don't see women on panels. We don't see women on like, you know, all these. So I feel like what's probably happening is that women are dropping off at every level because they're not getting the opportunities that they should be getting. So here's like, I don't remember what the principle is called, but there is this principle about how, you know, you automatically gravitate towards people who are like you, right? So if there are men who are in positions of power, of course, it's other men who are getting promoted. It's other men who are being invited to these panels. And right. that's why I said I was super excited when I saw th this panel and I was like, yes, it's all, I might have even said that. I was like, yes, I need to do this for sure. Um, because it's not happening. It's not happening and like, it just yeah. has those cascading effects. Like there are women who want to de do design and are going to design schools because I saw it. So I refuse to believe that that has changed in the last, it couldn't have gone backwards in the last 15 years. It's just that they're not getting the visibility they are not in the boys club, so they don't get those opportunities. They don't know what an example looks like because they look at panels and they don't see any women on there. So like what reason do they have to believe that they can make it there? Like all of that is happening, right? And I'll tell you like a, from personal example, and this is like, I'm, I was kicking myself about this. Um, so here in the US and LA, um, on my team, it's most, so the team itself is like balanced, like men and women, but on the leadership team, it just happens to be all women right now because we used to have like two men on there and then one of them moved, the other one like left the company. So it just happens to be all women. I just started hiring in India because we're building a team down in Hyderabad. I was myself on like LinkedIn and like looking through profiles and we found amazing candidates and we're pretty close to closing on like, uh, you know, a few of the candidates there, but there were no women in there right now i can sit here and say oh that's the pipeline problem but how can i say that if i did not find karti if i did not find Gita, right that's just if i had seen them and i'm not assuming that you would want to work with me i'm just saying like you know just as an example if i had seen them and then decided that no it was not a good fit then i could say there's a pipeline problem i didn't even right. know about them right so i am just my network is not good enough that problem is me it's not the pipeline Right. So 
I think that's where it really comes down to, like one of the examples that I use, and then I'll stop talking about this because I can go on about this topic forever. So here, like in LA, because I live like a mile from the beach and we have like golden sand in LA, right? And on the East Coast in the US, Florida, you have like white sand. So it's kind of like me saying, oh, I want like all kinds of sand in my backyard. And then, then I go one mile because it's like close to me and bring the sand and I complain, there was no white sand here. All I could find was gold sand. Well, shit, you go to the East Coast if you want that sand. Just don't do the convenient thing that has never worked for diversity and then say there are no women in the pipeline. Well, no, you need to look in other places. You need to fill that pipeline way before you start hiring or way before you start organizing a panel or any of those. So I will calm down now. Overall, I think I will end on the note that this panel is great and I'm so I'm so glad that I am expanding my network because pipeline is just not an excuse. Couldn't couldn't agree more with you. I'll I'll obviously this is a topic close to my heart also. I I will go next and and I completely agree that uh, you know the fact that women in tech are comparatively low or uh, you know, people who know about such women uh, or, or women who are visible to rest of the network is really low. So top of the funnel problem, I maybe, maybe not. Um, in fact, until very recently, I had all men team in a so-called soft field like design. Uh, and I have significantly noticed that women tend to choose, you know, B2B sector less. Maybe that's an assumption because when I was hiring again, top of the funnel, uh, I also found very, very less women. When I was looking through LinkedIn or through recruiting managers, the list that came in hardly contained, you know, probably five to 10% women. And I was just asking myself why? And probably exactly the same thing, right? Network, is my network not strong enough? Am I, am I not able to find these women because they're non-existent or is my network, you know, not strong enough? Uh, was the question in my mind exactly uh, but but this fact is changing uh, given the fact that i've hired really bright women in last few months in my team uh, without lowering my bar that is uh, but how how we can fix that you know maybe you know hr policies development opportunities flexibility etc but that's to attract more talent but awareness is, is there more awareness in the industry for these women uh, who are available and are we promoting them, right? More women, I feel, talking about their experiences like we are today, right? I was extremely happy when this was an all-women uh, panel, Siddharth, thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, so more women uh, getting exposure, more women being celebrated for their achievements will inspire a hell lot of confidence in my opinion uh, and i'll tell you a story actually we have this yearly award at uh, clever tap which is called clever tap gems and i'm proud to say that two out of three, three awards of clever tap gems were backed by women so once they're in there they've, they've They've already contributed a lot. They have a lot more to offer. They, their portfolio is strong. Just that these women are not known for probably several reasons. They lack of time. And I see myself struggling, right? A working mother of two. I hardly, ha I have no portfolio. So if you just go look for me uh, on Google, you will not find my portfolio because I've, I've never got a breather in my career to create a decent resume or a portfolio to myself. So uh, when I look at the fancy portfolios other designers have with so much experience, I feel, am I lack lacking somewhere? You know, is it is it my problem that, you know, the visibility uh, is because lack of online presence, if you will. Uh, but that's not really the case. It's, it's not the competence. It's about awareness and it's about, uh, you know, celebrating these women. So uh, I, f I feel that more women in leadership is uh, directly proportional to inspiring more confidence in women candidates eventually, and hence, you know, broadening the uh, funnel eventually down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever this question about women comes, a uh, lot of women hate me for saying this uh, because I say that I don't see any difference. Um, when it comes to work, it's all about your competence. There is nothing, no gender uh, there, right? But 
as a mother of two um, growing boys uh, how much time or you like how you said geeta i don't have a portfolio um, so a lot of women come and uh, ask me like how do you do so much i'm like i am not doing anything if i had time like uh, you know other men at home <laughs> probably i must be crushing it right <laughs> so <laughs> so in in, in many ways I, I i am incredibly lucky because my entire family is super supportive which means that if i if i want to work through night um sabrish will not you know have a single word he in fact he will make a coffee and come and give it to me in fact he was now just knocking the door and saying would you like something i'm like mm-hmm. stop it right I mean, that kind of support you need and if you if we need to produce more women men need to support women first thing first and because somebody is there to support me if he has his you know if he is upset with the fact that i am sitting and talking uh, at 10 o'clock and you know not taking care not putting children to bed stuff like that it would not be possible and ambitious women right i mean they need to work um, 5x more than men and it's like you are paying a price for being ambitious that's pretty much what happens so you get tired after a point especially after marriage after childbirth after you kind of get tired um for example i i i used to go to the uh, pumping room um just to take the milk out and keep it for my baby that is how he will feed tomorrow right if i forget he doesn't feed tomorrow that's a huge deal right so these are all things the men in my team used to say that karthi the alarm is ringing you need to go right and 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 that's how sensitive the men were and because of that i was able to do whatever i'm able to. today my father in law made idlis and said please you know eat and go and talk whatever you are going to talk and it was not my mother or my mother in law it's the men who are supporting and that is what makes it incredible and even at at office right um arjun says that karthi you have this in you just go i will take care of stuff in office and that is where so so they keep saying that behind every man success there is a woman behind every women success there are several men and and that is something that that's that i don't think every woman is getting that in many ways i feel i i have run women in product for almost a year and every single meeting we had the same discussions coming up again that i am not supported and same problems right compared to men women have confidence issues imposter issues in fact in, they they have like 3x 4x more and it's important to go ahead and make sure that their credibility their visibility their findability their evidence is out there in in fact that is something which we need to have programs to really push this up and that's the only way we are going to bring this stem women into doing incredible stuff if you go and ask about their ambition about their vision they are all fabulously so this is why in our office we have a 50 50 ratio um we are a very small team but the men in our office are much more you know feminine in that sense right they really take care when we are to to an extent where when we we have pms and we show off our faces they know it they are like okay we will not bother you guys for you know that's a that's incredible and and they have gone around and helped us to to really cope up and to me that support is something if every office gives i think women will flourish um i keep saying that women are the version 2 uh, product of of god version 1 he created with so many bugs and they are men i can say this to you here siddharth <laughs> because we are more women <laughs> yeah so with all the bugs corrected and and having a better version i think this breed is needed especially in problem solving for you to really think connect dots being you know really understanding stuff so 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 i i am finding more and more that i'm able to do certain things when i have the support i don't think they have the support in fact women need more support especially after childbirth after um you know dealing with so many other things if an electricity bill is not paid it's you okay if if grocery is going down in your inventory it's you you have 
if maggie is fed you are the one who will feel guilty because your child is not eating nutritious meal and these are all things that is running in you imagine the cognitive overload that women go through and today don't take me in any other way so that can crush it yeah a madri or karti need to really take care of so many things to come and crush it in in a round table like this so it's so it's it's just it's not a level playing field siddharth in many many ways but at the end of the day it's competence for which so i don't want us to be treated like oh my god you are a woman so let me lower your no don't don't pull the bar down keep the bar very high we want to play with you just that give us an opportunity to play in 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 that sense support us and that's that would be my request to all men out there who are talking about women not being in the boardroom uh, if it if there is support we will be able to do it and that also bothers me because because in the boardroom everybody behaves a certain way we are becoming that way which means our diversity is going down in many many ways right so we are becoming more masculine in <laughs> and we are not bringing in that that the yin and the yang is not happening in the boardroom which means the whole world is becoming one way and this also bothers me because we are not taking care of this change in how a woman thinks success is if i need to really show i can't be weak i can't dirty i cannot show off my irritation of a pms no you you put on a mask and show yourself in a certain way and that is um it's okay be yourself right and 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 these are all things we don't get to talk we, we we can't talk anywhere we don't have a forum to really talk about this if at all we talk we talk among women it's more like a gossip i want men to hear this right so put it on right. to many more men so that they will listen to all this stuff and kind of understand that women can do a better job they can really really help and together we make an amazing team that 1 plus 1 equal to 11 not just 2 plus 2 as 5 we are a far better mathematics right i mean right. that's enable and i i think to get there uh, we need men to understand what is happening to women women need to talk about what is going on with them which means a relationship balance is needed this inequality will not help right mm -hmm. we are brought up in a culture that a, a male child can need not do much but a woman need to do a lot more stuff like that we still have it it's lot better i mean 90% better but that 10% if we remove that i think we will have more women so that that's one of the reasons why i run a lot of women communities i talk to women i kind of see where are we missing it out it's just somebody just needs to boost and say hey you can do it just this much and that's all that's all and hairwardi was was such a huge example i mean when madhuri said i can't do it karthi probably somebody else these are all men who i don't know how to talk to them to stop what will happen no 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 probably you should you have gray hair how long this gray hair is going to be used you need to get gray go do it madhuri is amazing i loved her so much she is awesome. <laughs> she's, yeah and our entire office pushes her and says you can do it no 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 i suck at this i'm not good at this da, 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 da. you should see the kind of dramas the when when she comes on on the screen she's perfect but right. behind oh my god there's a turmoil somebody should take the wrath of a woman as well right <laughs> so i'm not saying that we are perfect but i think with support we will be able to, we will be able to bring in that phenomenal diversity to the table that celebrating differences is important somebody should talk about how women are inside the the two tails of the brain is not telling it all right it kind of puts women in a pocket and that's not a good idea i don't know if, if you girls have watched it it's a fabulous laughter you you should watch that that, that little episode in in youtube unbelievable but he kind of put women in in a very different box so yeah it's important that uh, i don't want women to become men so that it's uh, it's important that we remain who we are and still go ahead and crush it so don't lower the bar right. don't tell us that you can't do it don't tell us that you need to feed the baby uh, oh my god i don't know if you will be handled if i say i will i will right if i say i can't i can't right
uh, folks, uh, uh, would you like to add on top of that? that? That was a lot of learning for me. So I uh, would love to like hear if you have anything to, I don't know, that, especially from the point of view of like, you know, uh, it, 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 it requires both sides to uh, make the level, level playing feel uh, like Karthi rightly said. And, uh, you know, uh, and I completely agree with my own family, like to my own uh, sister uh, in the, today's day and age says, what will you do studying so much? You are going to get married in the end in 2020. Uh, where I have to fight back uh, on that. So I completely understand like those systematic issues and biases, like Asa said, are deep rooted and they're not going to go in one day. But uh, these progress, uh, you know, we are making these progress, especially I wanted to speak about parental tax that came again and again. And uh, especially like, you know, I, I, I don't remember the documentary, but there was a documentary on Netflix talking about how uh, if you take a year worth of break, uh, you know, just to be a mother and then when you come back, everything has changed. People have moved on. Uh, you know, things have moved on and the entire field has changed. How has uh, Karthi and Geeta, your experience been on that front? Yeah, so uh, so this generally lack of uh, child care for uh, they, that forces women to take a long break right, for, for from their careers. And I've, I've totally witnessed it uh, with my friends uh, when they are ready to join back in full force. The world has already moved on and uh, there is already high levels of competition and there is a lot of hurdle. So even if they want to come back, they don't know where to begin with. So uh, I would like to call it a fact, at least in India, where mother has to give up all the ambitions to raise the children and, you know, uh, because of the non-flexible nature of probably the work. Uh, and organizations already assume that the woman is not going to be available because she's a working mother and there will be demanding times, demanding situations, and hence the growth position as well as sometimes money is compromised for women. Uh, Karthi, like you, right? I've been, if I talk about myself, I've been extremely fortunate to have a huge support from my working mother-in-law, actually. I, I like to tell this story across forums because like it is important for men to support women, it is also very important for women to support women, mm. right? Uh, I was extremely lucky because when my first child was born, my mother-in-law, who was a school principal, she left her job to raise my child. She moved to Mumbai, she stayed with us, and she practically raised both my kids. And that kind of a support, of course, my I have my in-laws, my husband is also working. So both of us working, it, and we don't believe in the nanny culture here. So it's a, it's a Gujarati family. So... Uh, you know, in-laws take care of kids, uh, their education, their feeding, their, uh, you know, play with them, the story time, everything. So that matters a lot, you know, when you have a support of not just men from your house, but uh, but your mother-in-law, especially if, if she's living with you, that, that means a lot. And, uh, you know, given the fact that right now, actually, uh, currently, we are in a pandemic situation. Uh, operations in tech are running pretty smoothly. Uh, so the assumption of non-productivity in flexibility of working hours and work from home is practically a myth now, right? And I'll wait for the data to come whenever it comes, but I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, more women will be encouraged if uh, work from home uh, is, a, is an option for them and flexible working hours is an option for them. And they can, they can take care of uh, or they can at least look after the house uh, while they're they're giving 100% at their job. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, I didn't mention my mother and my mother-in-law. I have two mothers, right? I mean, uh, generally you have this mother-in-law figure who is a torture chamber. That's how it is. Picture, but mine has been the sweetest, right? Sweetest. So, um, because I had both of them, I had to live with the six weeks, eight weeks maternity leave in the US and in Singapore. That's about it. I mean, I, I was back in office I, with, with a little baby, like 40 day old baby and I, I was back in office. I haven't had a single day break in the last 20 years of my career. And I, I sometimes feel that I should take like an, a, a, a gap year, probably a midlife gap year or something like Sabbatical. that. Sabbatical. Right? 
<laughs> sabbatical whatever <laughs> you need to you so so i i i i was obsessed with work that's a different story i was a workaholic it is not that i i was afraid that i will lose a job i i used to you know say that if not you another company in 7 years tenure in hp every year once i have given my resignation saying that big deal you know because it's a round table i'm not using certain words but yeah that, that's pretty much how i used to you know go ahead and talk because i was very confident about what i can do i mean about the co- competence levels i had the confidence of really solving problems so i never had this fear that somebody will remove me from job and you know though those things were not that i was a workaholic and i still i i, I wanted to write as a recovering workaholic in, in my linkedin that that should be the right title right so that's pretty much what is my story so for me mom was there so my son is 615 and all through 15 years she has been there if i moved to us she moved to us if i if i was in singapore she lived in so we found a country which allowed us to have a visa for parents which is completely on uh, your visa which means on my pr she could completely live with us i mean no need to worry about anything we wanted countries like that and and that was a gift right and because i was a single child and it was just me and mom so it was much easier for her to come along i don't know how many mothers will be able to do it my sisters and cousin sisters they are not able to do what i did but this so it's you know so many stars need to align for a woman to be successful in many many ways um i still don't know if i belong to the success category but you know what i i i can still proudly say that i did take my career very seriously i did not make any sacrifices i did not give it up for anybody else and i was paid for who i am and and this was a big deal so feeding babies and taking care when you are actually handling a team that is also motherhood in many many ways many many ways i don't know if if men see it that way i see it like a you know like a, a team mother or something like that right i mean that that motherhood comes because you care about people you were not feeling well yesterday how is your tooth doing um pro- hey you had a headache what happened to your ganglion cyst you keep asking these things you cannot you know not think about your people like that so i think it's it's more about um that nature i don't want it to go away in the name of success in the name of rat race in the name of crushing it um that's one of the reasons why i started experience because i know that i will not be able to do this in a corporate probably corporates are getting better i said that oh, i can't deal with this stuff anymore i want to just run my team the way i i will run my family so to me i i used to tell them that i have two biological kids and i have many design kids and that's about it right i mean that's, that's such right. a fabulous way of of really looking at it and that gave me peace and now people are asking me are you leaving lot on the table i'm like how much do you want <laughs> how much yeah you eat probably twice a day and when and if you really live for 100 years probably x dollars is what you want and that's it you are not going to miss meals stop it we need to redefine success in that sense right right um, so yeah uh, we can go on and on like this that that, that, that topic is vast three women <laughs> <laughs> if you put three women in room and ask such questions you are going to have the round table forever oh, 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 oh. Uh, that, that, that's that's the, that's the intent here as well <laughs> uh, which brings me to you know kathi you uh, beautifully brought us back to back full circle on uh you know feeling uh like team leadership growing a team is like raising children in many sense being a mother in many sense especially when you have to uh, have you have to keep an eye out uh, you know 10 10 uh, steps ahead of how they are growing uh, about their own nature their own nuances their own pitfalls and encourage them and you know channel their energies in the right way uh how like what has been one of the uh most important piece of advice in terms of picking these people and we spoke about this a little earlier in terms of like how do you hire people uh, you know in, in an organization can change the face of organization and what have been some key uh, things you know to keep in mind that always come back to you when you're hiring because we all make mistakes when we're hiring right all of us have made mistakes and we continue to make mistakes uh, every now and then uh, especially when it comes to hiring and that's how we learn so what are the some things that always have uh, stood true for you when it uh, comes to picking people Okay I I have lots to say in this so let me keep it brief So um I looked for potency I mean that that's the right word 
right? I, I'm, I'm looking for something which will grow. If I give the right water, sunlight, fertile soil, and if I just prune it a little bit, it will grow, right? And that potency is something that I look for. And I, I, I don't get that in whiteboard challenges, in their portfolio reviews, in tell me about yourself, no. I actually take them out for a coffee, I have lunch with them, and I kind of really look at them in terms of different, different parts of life. And I call them just like that, more like a friend and not really as a hiring manager, and these are all how you react in life is how you will be able to figure out a potency. And you, in all reality, I did not have this luxury as a corporate manager. But um, when I started my own and I started helping my other corporate friends with hiring, um, which I hate to say, but uh, that's, that, is, that is the nuance that, that I look for. So your credentials is, is one part. Of course, they, they give you evidence proof of, okay, I have these tags, I went, I had a structured education, I went here, I did this, all of that stuff. So I look at it in, in five levels, but the bullseye has always been that potential, the potency that I'm looking for, right? And that is what a manager should or leader should really look for. Because if you keep hiring for credentials, it's going to be very expensive. Because that person would have been probably, I have a dear friends here from NID, from Google, and you need to pay more <laughs> in all honesty, right? Uh, so, but when you really want to grow somebody, you need, you need that potential. They have proved their potential. They have the credential which shows the potential. So depending upon your budget, depending upon what role you are hiring, depending upon what, what kind of a person you want, depending upon what kind of, uh, culture that the, the stardust that this person is bringing in. So with so many things, the the crux is is figuring out this, and you will not get that in that interview. No, not in the, your bar raiser interview. Not in not in your um, you know uh, VP of products interview. None of those. You need to really speak to the person inside. Um, and whenever somebody called me and said, you know what, I sucked with that whiteboard challenge, and here is. Here is my second attempt, third attempt. I couldn't sleep. I love that kind of, you know, um, I shouldn't give away these tips, but um, that's, <laughs> that's what really shows that person is interested in solving a problem, doesn't care about whether you select or not. I want people with that backbone, with that individuality coming and say, I give a damn about you. Who are you to sell me I'm selected or rejected? You know, that, that, that's the right. kind of people we should be working with, right? So I... I I build teams like that. And as a manager, um, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing. I have had zero attrition so far. This is 15 years, zero attrition. So I have let people go, but of course, let them go in a nice way. But uh, nobody has left. They're taken care of, right? And, and that potency has, has grown and they have seen that, oh my God, I can become a mango tree like this. I can give fruits. Oh my God, this is, I, I never expected. That is important. Right. Garden, uh, uh, just leave them right. to grow. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful analogies, Karthi. Love that. Uh, Asa, what has your perspective been in terms of like key things when you're picking people for your team? Yeah, so uh, most of the hiring that I've done, like before Google, I used to hire a bunch of distinct, the small design firm that I worked at, right? But that was so long ago. So I feel like most of my hiring memories are now from Google because I've been there for like almost eight years now. Um, I feel like I am in it's a slightly different position because there's this whole hiring mechanism that we have that like I actually have not much control over because it's like a centralized hiring for Google, right? So the skill part is usually taken care of by the time it gets to a point that I'm talking to a candidate, right? Like they've gone through intensive screening with recruiters, other hiring managers and whatnot. So I mostly focus on the three values that I had talked about. And it's actually really interesting because all of those three values, they're not really about how someone is. It's all will-based, right? Are you willing to put people first? Are you willing to invest in craft? Are you willing to work right. with your partners as your first partner? So it really has, it's, it's a very level playing field. It's all about, will you do this? And if someone says, yes, I will, because they have very, uh, very, like they don't have much incentive to lie at that point. Why would someone want to be on a team where this is the norm if that's not something that they're into? 
So I feel like that makes it very simple because I just ask these three questions. I typically say, and I mean, this is not a secret. I always ask people, what are the three things that are your must haves from your team and your manager? And here are my three must haves. And we're able to tell if it's a fit like really well based on this. So because of that, I think I've been pretty fortunate that I cannot recall too many bad hires because most people, or if any bad hires really, because most people really do, um, you know, they said they were into this. There hasn't been any reason that someone isn't, hasn't been into that idea. Um, and they just, you know, fit in really well on their team. So I, I would really advocate for like very clear value-based hiring, of course, on top of all the skills and the craft and all of that, but being very, very clear about what is it that you want and making sure that's aligned with the team that where you're going, because otherwise it's just not going to work. The person is not going to be happy. The manager is not going to be happy. So very clearly articulate articulating what does the team want what does the manager want what do i want is it a good fit or not so my first three pointers are also apart from skill of course given the skill uh, is filtered through uh, by resume and the portfolio and the reason why the candidate uh, you know came into your interview is only because uh, the person was qualified but then the three things which i look at is will 100 person because uh, is the desire to excel, desire to, you know, put some skin in the game, desire to excel, desire to work with this company, with this team in the way, the way it is today, right? So that will is, I think that plays, uh, you know, at least 70% of, uh, you know, the, the part there. Culture fit, extremely necessary again, because, because probably the person may have skill, but, uh, maybe it's not a culture fit maybe the person is not team player so evaluating uh, a candidate on the culture fit yeah, we we have again our own, own culture uh, you know criteria uh, statements where we uh, where we kind of evaluate from the interview we conduct uh, whether the person is fit or not so obviously will culture uh, skill and uh, yeah that's these are the three criteria for uh, me as well and i uh, i ask candidates uh, these questions about you know what what are the qualities they apart from what are the qualities which i am looking uh, into a candidate what what is their expectation from the company and what is their expectation from a manager if they are going to be reporting into me, what are they expecting out of me? How, how can I play a part into their learning process and their growth? So uh, these are some things which I evaluate when I interview. Right. Brilliant. Thank you so much, folks. We are almost at the end of our panel. I wish uh, we are just getting started. We're just getting warmed up and we have to close. It sounds unfair. But that leaves us for another episode. I have one last question to ask you all. Uh, to all the young folks listening in and tomorrow's designers, uh, today's designers, tomorrow's leaders and even today's leaders, all the folks who are listening in. So I want to tell if you if you uh, land in a startup, give 500% to it. Do not limit yourself to what you are hired for. Uh, your job teaches you a lot. Uh, so be proactive, pick things on your own, be humble, help others. Uh, and learn from others. So every day is an opportunity to uh, widen your horizons. And um, let me tell you something, only a few leaders are born and others are made. Be If, if you're not a leader that is born, you can definitely thrive to become a leader by learning. So uh, that's something I want to tell. Beautiful. So I would say that if you are a woman or anyone really and having self-doubts, you should know that everyone has self-doubts, especially for the women watching. Don't think that men don't have self-doubts. Like everyone has their own demons that they deal with and their own insecurities. And everyone acts despite of those insecurities. So there's no reason why you cannot do it. So yes, you might have insecurities. Yes, you might have self-doubts, but know that everyone does and act despite of that. And there is no reason why someone else deserves success or happiness more than you do. Everyone deserves it equally. Wow, beautiful, powerful, Kathy. So this has been my mantra uh, for me and I, I would like to give the same to the um, upcoming generation as well, that your life is your responsibility. Nobody is going to really uh, take care of your life. If it is 36,500, 
days, you're living for 100 years, it is yours, right? Out of which you, your career is only 7,000 days. Now make a choice whom you want to work with. Make a choice, what do you want to work with? And this is a choice that you're making. So when your career is your responsibility, is your choice, you will execute it properly. So time is life. I mean, time is money is bullshit because money can be made, saved, shared, you know, multiplied. All your board mass can be applied to that. But with, with, with time, uh, no way, right? So time is life. And in many ways, it's ticking. And don't waste in a place where you're not excited about. Don't make choices out of, you know, I, I, I just took it up because there was nothing else. Um, if, if every choice has a consequence and you will pay for it. So I, I used to uh, tell my students that, uh, you know, uh, make sure you die well, right? And dying well is very, very hard. Living well is easy. Like a ticker, you can just go up and down and you can live it. But dying well means you have to live exponentially very well, right? So if you take up your career as your responsibility, you will act on it very, very differently. You will own it very differently. You will ask questions very differently. You will choose your organizations, your managers, your team, your you know kind of work, everything. When you are such a clear person, it's very easy to work with you. It is very hard to work with confused souls, right? right. So go ahead, make yourself so clear give us an ability to 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 help you you know let's be a small speck in in your growth journey and that's pretty much what i would ask all the youngsters out there because their career they need to take care of it wow that's powerful time is life and use it wisely know where it is going thank you so much for joining in geeta asta and karthi this was a wonderful conversation i hope to be able to invite you for more of, of, of such conversations with uh, multitude of people and um, you know multitude of topics uh, and folks thank you so much for tuning in uh, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to let's go for like. it Asta, it's your Share. Turn. <laughs> okay Kati, you go first <laughs> say like <laughs> Gita is like <laughs> yeah. okay one more time one two three go like share subscribe Yes, <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Asta e ce Ok, Kati, you go first. Say like. <laughs> Gita is like. <laughs> yeah. Ok, one more time. One, two, three, go. Like. Share. Subscribe. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>